I wrote it on Divine Providence um, because there's a lot of people that, there's so many topics and themes out there, but for me, Divine Providence is, is kind of what encapsulates all of them. When we learn how to trust and follow our intuition and the Spirit, then that's where all the problems disappear. Because um, the problem was, was really a problem of listening and following, and once we listen and follow, then, then all, it kind of brings us into an experience where we see that we have everything and we are whole and complete and innocent, and there's nobody to, to blame or, you, there's no striving and struggling once you're in that state of acceptance. So, to me that's what Divine Providence is all about. Um, it's not so much just, it doesn't have a particular form. What I teach people with Divine Providence is that everyone is living in Divine Providence because we're all being sustained by this beautiful spirit. And it's only these ego overlays that teach us that we, we have to play these roles and we have to take on these earthly responsibilities and obligations and feel guilty and feel like less than and all that. And, and uh, so I, I teach that everyone's really in Divine Providence, but they don't know it. <laughs> They're being sustained by the love of God every moment of every day, but they have a lot of training and conditioning where they believe that, that either others are supporting them, people, governments, neighbors, family, or they believe that per they personally are in charge of their life, that they're the ones that are in control, they're the ones driving the driving the car and it's kind of a, a sense of autonomy and I can do it all on my own kind of thing and that's just as much of an ego uh, defense as believing that other people are taking care of you. Uh, so often in childhood we do feel very dependent when we seem to come and bring this world with us. It's a, it's a dependency setup where we feel like we're dependent on parents and then we go through adolescence and work on more, getting more autonomy. And then once you seem to become an autonomous, mature, functioning adult citizen, you still have stresses and struggles of trying to carry the burden of being the one individual that's in charge of your life and not really understanding why you can't uh, have it go so smooth. Why does it have to have so many uh, pitfalls and so many uh, temptations and and uh, struggles, you know. And that's just because again the ego is still and they're trying to steer the ship, you know, trying to run the show. And we haven't fully just let ourselves be like a leaf in the river, you know, just carried, carried down the stream. When we learn how to really trust and be carried, then that's when it gets very easy for us. So we want this to be practical, so that's why all these gatherings, I just kind of <coughs> I show up in willingness and then everyone talks from their heart from, you know, what's going on in their life and the things that they found helpful and where they seem to have their stuck spots and like that. And then we, we call upon the Holy Spirit to just bring clarity for all of us. Uh, you know, it's like everybody seems to have individual problems, but really they aren't. Uh, it's just the ego is the problem. Yeah. Speaking of driving a car, um, there seems to be, well there has been a lot of pain brought up collectively in the world in regard to the increased gas prices lately. Um, can you talk about that from the perspective of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, it's, it's like what seems to be when the world goes through economic uh, downturns, recessions, um, we were talking about that on the way uh, here when Tom was driving that, that he was saying that when, like when the U.S. dollar goes down and the U.S. economy goes down, a lot of other economies are seemingly interdependent on that. Um, and there are so many fluctuations. I, when I've just been traveling through Europe, uh, people were telling me that, you know, over a number of years it's like Ireland has really been booming. Uh, economically growing and growing and the housing growth and the industries and so forth, but Tom was saying it's starting to to peak off and, and come down a little bit now, <laughs> along with a lot of uh, countries, you know, that are kind of going through that, including the United States with its so-called subprime crisis and uh, lending out all this money and not so ethical practices in lending and, and so 
it does, you start to see that everything's like an undoing and an unlearning, whereas the world seems to have its peaks and its valleys in terms of uh, economic and social advancements and technological advancements. Um, that, that all of it is really just an opportunity to learn, to, to listen in, in a deeper, clearer way and to become more God-dependent, more dependent on your intuition, is the positive uh, interpretation of all this. Um, because in the Bible, you know, the teaching was from Jesus, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And in A Course in Miracles, he explains the meaning and says, ah, little children, infants, are completely dependent on their parents and the adults in their lives for survival. If they were just left, you know, out in the woods uh, as an infant, uh, without any kind of care, then they wouldn't survive. So he was saying the meaning of, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, is that you need to likewise be as dependent as little infants are on their parents, on you need to do that with the Holy Spirit, or your intuitive inner voice. You need to be so dependent on only that voice, to hear only that voice in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't rely on opinions and conclusions and judgments and past learning to get you there. Or uh, some of you might remember the, the original uh, um, this is a Star Wars series where the, in one of the series, uh, uh, Luke has to go back to what this giant uh, thing, construction called the Death Star. And he's got to go inside of the Death Star, and he's got to get to the core, flying his, his uh, spacecraft, and he's got to make a direct hit uh, in the middle of the Death Star in order to dismantle to shut down the Death Star. And he's going in there and he's trying, you know, he thinks it's almost like an impossible mission, but he's trying to do it. And when he gets closer and closer, he's like seeing how it's, it's just feeling overwhelming and impossible for him to make this direct hit. And then you hear the, the voice, use the force, Luke. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's again a Holy Spirit metaphor for you have to have guidance. Uh, you're not going to wake up from this dream and you're not going to forgive without that still voice in your mind leading the way. It doesn't matter how many workshops you've done, how many books you've read, how many places you've traveled, in the end it comes down to intuition is going to have to take you into this be still and know that I am God, you know, down to the final uh, conclusion of this uh, dream. And that the Holy Spirit is there, you know, the Spirit's there to guide you in this journey. You weren't driving the plane in the first place anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you weren't doing that. I felt like it was kind of like that, you know, when I was going yeah. on, it was kind of like, okay, I gotcha. Okay, where are we going next, you know? The, the eyes being covered is more, I'm not going to use my, my impressions and past learning, you know, and that's what Lucas told, you know, use the force, in other words, his instrument panel is not going to do it. All of his skills and abilities that he's learned in, the, in, in his training is not going to do it. It's Obi-Wan Kenobi, kind of the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, use the force. Like, let me guide you in from here to dismantle this Death Star. And the ego is like the Death Star. It's this belief in your mind that you're separate from God. And it has to be was seen as nothingness. It has to be dismantled or shown that it's not real and true. So, to use that kind of movie metaphor, we have to, we have to truly let go and, and follow guidance. And in my life too, I've seen that nothing I ever learned from this world, it has never really brought me peace of mind. So I needed a new purpose. It wasn't that I had any regret about those 11, 10, 10 years in university and all the training. It was that all those skills and abilities were still being used by the ego to make, a, make and maintain a personal identity, a personality, a mask over my Christ Self. And then I needed a new purpose for all those skills and abilities. So I had no regrets. You know, it wasn't like I felt like I wasted any time or wasted anything. It was just 
all turned to a new purpose. So in terms of the, the rising gas prices and everything, it's like, you know, it's all symbols and sometimes when things seem to be taken away from us or we can't, uh, we can't play the game of bigger, better, faster, more, uh, it starts to break down a bit, kind of like Alice in Wonderland where she just kind of goes tumbling down the, the rabbit hole. I think uh, that's part of, of what's happening and in human history and, and what seems to unfold in part of human history is going to be a, a lot of that, the lesson of uh, things seeming to fall apart and break down. There's still forecasts from the ascended, ascended masters that there will still be a lot of economic growth on the planet, you know, that's just kind of expands and contracts and that's going to continue on. Uh, we're not going to reach a, a stage of like some people were saying in 2012, it will all be over anyway and we can just, yeah. we'll all be back in, in heaven so we can just make it four more years, you know. Uh, it's, it's this expansion and contraction is just way, way out uh, on the surface of consciousness and for those that really decide to go much, much deeper beyond the surface, they will find there's a lot, the peace is there, it's always been there uh, regardless of how the forms shift and change. And, I have no idea how it will influence, I mean, a few years ago I thought, hmm, it seems to be gas prices, uh, everything's more expensive. Uh, I thought, I wonder how this is going to work with me traveling and living off donations and maybe I'll just be up in a treehouse somewhere and just uh, <coughs> meditating or something, but, but actually uh, it's, it's like the Spirit's like, no, no, that's nothing, you know, <laughs> wherever there's a strong call wherever you, you're guided to, to go, it'll all always flow. And that's the way that it's continued, it really hasn't been, there's been no sense where I've had to stop and go, okay Jesus, it's worked for 16 years, but <laughs> we've got rising gas prices, we've got, <laughs> yeah, you can't cook without you. <laughs> we've got global warming, and this and this and this, and he's like, oh, please, please. <laughs> I see this is uh, uh, getting back to our theme. Uh, it would appear to me that um, forgiveness is healing. Yeah. Is, is, is that accurate or is that? Yeah, there's anonymous forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the best thing you could ask anybody or help anybody who is sick is to ask them to forgive whatever it is they're holding out on. You know? Yeah. And it's deep. I mean, I, I was in Switzerland. Uh, very recently, and I spoke all on Saturday, spoke all on Sunday, and this man said, but our theme, David, our theme is forgiveness, and we really, really need to be practical, we need to have a, I need a process, or I need some kind of direct thing, and so I, I talked a little more, but it's, you have to come deeper into this idea that, that Forgiveness is not what we thought it was. It, it, that's the reason why the forgiveness hasn't worked, in the sense of bringing a lasting state of peace of mind, because the egos got in there and thought, aha, I can play the religion game, I'll just make up a false sense of forgiveness and, and have people go after that thing. And then, when they don't get it, they'll get all dis disillusioned and feel despair and say, there is no God, and so forth. But we have been trying to, to hold on, like people would tell me for years, they would say, forgive David, yes, yes, but never forget. And I'd be like, oh, <laughs> that sounds really, sounds wicked. <laughs> you know, it's like, sounds like creamy and nice, forgive, forgive, with a soft tone, but never forget, you know, with a finger. And I'd be like, hmm. But no, this is, we've had an amnesia going on where we've forgotten love. And now, I say true forgiveness is we have to have a reverse amnesia. We have to forget this world and remember the love, <laughs> instead of forgetting the love and remembering this world. So, so if, if they're going to say to me, forgive but never forget, I'll just say, yeah, forgive illusions and never forget the love of God. Don't use the never forget with grievances, <coughs> because they seem to be implying that, you know, I mean, I've heard historians tell me, 
That's why we study the past, so that we won't make the same mistake again. <coughs> That's worked out well. That really has worked uh, with the wars, you know. <laughs> we've, we had to sit through all those classes <laughs> and study all this history, you know, of all these different uh, things throughout history and conflicts, and then here we are, you know, and it's what's going on with different parts of the world, Iraq and different places, it's still the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have to actually come to a humble place and say, well, what we've tried before has not worked. So we need to be open to something that's completely different and new. And to me that's what uh, I found in using A Course in Miracles. I found a teaching that said, forgive your brother for what he has not done. Uh, at first you just look and you say, what did I say? What, what is that for what he has not done? Clearly, he seems to have done this and this and that. You know, we have the memories. Nowadays with technology we have it recorded. <laughs> People who can say, I've got it on, on tape. <laughs> it's not only my memory, well, I've got it on a, a videotape or a DVD. But it's like, what he's saying is, all, the whole belief in linear time is part of the trick. You know, that we're not, we're not trying to forgive, we're not trying to deny what seemed to happen, but we're saying that maybe our perception, our interpretation of what we think happened to us against our own will or against our choice, maybe that was part of a trick and a mistake. There's a movie that was done in Australia called Dark City, where there's actually a scene in a major motion picture where the whole dark world is, is false memories that have been mixed and matched, kind of like a reincarnation compressed into one dark world where the roles keep shifting around and it, there's one scene where the main character comes and he's in prison and he's behind glass and his wife comes and she feels bad because she's sure that she committed adultery that she's hurt her husband and his psychological problems are her fault. And she's really sad, she's got great remorse and, and he kind of leans forward and he says, you didn't do it. And she's like, I didn't do it. <laughs> like had this look on her face like it seemed pretty real to me. He said, no, what if we never met before this moment? And he's like, getting this huge insight that the world of images has been a trick and that it's all been based on a false identity to make guilty, you know, that this whole world was made to perpetuate feelings of guilt and shame and hurt and sadness and what if this trick is actually just a trick and that we can see that, that we can meet in the moment for the first time without any sense of of the past, like the power of now, like Tully, like mm. all the ancient traditions have said, learn to live in the moment. What if the present moment offers us the release of, of every problem and difficulty we've ever had? And what if Jesus is right when he says that the present moment is the closest approximation mm. that this world offers to eternity? That this is our, our real opportunity Maybe he meant it when he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was a simple statement 2,000 years ago, but a hand is very close. If you just take it in the most simple, direct way, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Maybe he was saying, it's so close, it's closer than your breath. You know, it's more intimate than, than even than breathing for a human being. It's so close. So for me, that's really what my journey has been uh, with the Course. I don't, uh, I don't read the book uh, anymore, I haven't read it for a number of years. I feel like my life experience is like the living A Course in Miracles where, um, I think we just, we just landed in Sweden and, and we had like two weeks of gatherings coming up in Sweden and I was just laying, reclining after my trip to Berlin and getting back and Jenny looked over at me and she said, have you prepared? Uh, and I said, prepared. Did you think about the gathering that we were having an hour? I just 
Yeah, we were about to, about to begin. She was just looking at me. Do you think about the gathering? And the only words that came out were, I am. <laughs> that, was, that was the answer, I am. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but it, was, it wasn't a thought. I mean, because I, preparation involves the future. If you're, I'm very much like, uh, like uh, Wayne Dyer, for example, He's, he loves to go and just sit down on a stage with a group of people and savor mm -hmm. the moment and see what happens. And that's from someone who's very shy and timid, who wouldn't even attempt to go on a stage before, uh, and certainly would have, gone, would have wanted to have some cue cards or some, some notes like I had in uh, when I was in graduate school and in 10 years of university, I would study and prepare and memorize things so that I would be ready and prepared. But this is not that at all. This, is, this requires no preparation. And in fact, you can't really prepare for the present moment at all. If you, as soon as you're into the preparations, it seems to push it off into the future. And that's why I think Jesus has a section in his book, A Course in Miracles, said which is, I need do nothing, mm -hmm. which he talks about long hours of meditation and contemplation and fighting <coughs> against sin. And these are the most traditional approaches to God that we've known on this planet. For centuries people have used these techniques. He calls them tedious and time-consuming. <laughs> uh, so then you're like, okay, tedious and time-consuming, what have you got? Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, your way will be different. You know, not in, in purpose. But, but in form, it's like a holy relationship is given you as a means of, of saving time for everyone, including yourself. And then he goes on to explain what that is. He just says, you and your brother are together, which I say is his way of saying, you're really just one mind. You think you've separated yourself off into all these separate little personalities, mm -hmm. but you're really just one. That's why it's simple. That's why you can, can achieve the whole enlightenment in one instant, if you really want it, is because it's, it's all, everything's already unified. You just have blocked it from your awareness, and you can accept that any moment you want. He'll say that in the, in the workbook. Perhaps today? I was like, yeah, okay. Perhaps today, then let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that approach every day, every moment, you know. That's the way I did those workbook lessons. I didn't see it as one lesson in 365. It was perhaps today. Who knows, there may never be a tomorrow. So why should I plan and prepare as if there is a tomorrow? So that's pretty radical when you, I mean, one of my degrees in, in the university was urban planning. So I spent five years how to learn to project things into the future and analyze things and like you would do if you were planning a city. You know, the infrastructure and the communication systems and transportation systems and electrical systems and everything. Just, and then I had to just kind of let it all go. Ten years of education, just poof, out the window. And, and then Jesus said, I'll, I'll use them, don't worry. It's a good skills that you developed. It was the ego that developed the skills, but he's like, oh, I'll take them over now and uh, use them for happiness and joy for the whole universe. And, okay. Okay, I'll go for that. Yeah. It seems radical. I mean, sometimes people think it's radical. Like when I was down in Australia, there was a woman sitting next to me that they brought in, this, this uh, Eastern Master. It's twice I've done gatherings with, with uh, female Eastern Masters, and this one hadn't eaten anything for 15 years. Um, she was a breatharian and she's had a cup of tea here and there. And so I, I opened the gathering by saying, oh, we're all working on forgiveness, but we have some extreme examples. I said, this one hasn't eaten anything for the last 15 years. This one eats whatever he's served, no matter what it is. <laughs> Everyone's like, I said, but your path need not be <laughs> so extreme. It's not about the food. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not. It's not an issue of food, it's not an issue of eating or not eating, or whatever. It's, it's much deeper than that. And then we got into talking about the experiences of forgiveness and, and healing. So, that's 
that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And forgiveness is healing. If anybody has any questions, just feel free to ask David. David, um, you mentioned it was on one of your posters there about your creations are holding their hands out for you. What do you, what do you, what is meant by that? Our creations. Yeah. Uh, what is meant by that? And of course, Marcus is something that always comes. That's a yeah, certain that's a good question. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, well, God is like the prime creator, and Christ is the creation of God, and then Christ has creations. So when it's mentioned in the Course, your creations, like on that quote with a small c, mm. it's meaning you, as Christ, have creations, and they're waiting for you. It's like, uh, they aren't in form, uh, the, the <coughs> animals and the, the plants and the trees and the, all the different aspects of the cosmos, none of that involves creations. Those are all perception and projections, mm. actually, of the ego. But creation, it's almost like, in this world you get, you know, children come from their parents, you get apples from apple trees and oranges from orange trees. You know, you, there, there's like a, such a thing as offspring in this world. And just like in the Bible, the begats, beget, beget, beget. <laughs> and if you shift that up to a spiritual realm, you could say that spirit comes from spirit. So, uh, that God is spirit and then Christ is an extension of that spirit, and the creations are an extension of Christ. So they all come in a continuous line of creation, with God being the originator. And in fact, Christ is an idea that's still in the mind of God, and then the creations of Christ are still in the mind of Christ, which is still in the mind of God. So, like a so yeah, it's like nothing has really left its source. The creations are all aware of their source. So, when it says a quote like, like your creations are waiting for you, it's speaking of the you that believes in this world, that has fallen asleep and forgotten heaven. And it's like, your creations are like part of your fan club, your, your, your cheerleaders, you know, go, go, <laughs> you, can, you can do it, you can forgive, you can, you can let go of these illusions and remember who you are, and if you remember who you are, then you'll remember who we are, because we are part of you, as you are part of God. So, even in Christian traditions, they talk about the, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's just a, Father is just another symbol for Creator, Son is just another symbol for Christ, or the creation of God. And the Holy Ghost is just also an eternal creation, but uh, this is a creation that seems to function for the mind that's asleep. The Holy Spirit is like the bridge back to remember God and Christ. So, there are no voices in heaven, because there are no words in heaven. <laughs> it's just pure oneness. Yeah, constant communication, more like t telepathic uh, communion and union and oneness. It's almost like an eternal dance, but not a dance with bodies, like a dance of happiness. Uh, and joy, a song of gratitude that goes on and on forever. And then the voice for God is, for the mind that believes it's fallen asleep, then the instruction or helpful uh, advice on relief has seemed to take the form of a voice. And that voice is the Holy Spirit. That aspect of the Holy Spirit is an illusion, because uh, it's just being used in time, but when time is over, there's no more need for a voice, so that voice will disappear along with time and space. But if the Holy Spirit was created as an e eternal creation of God. So people say, somebody asked me one time, if we separated the first time, what happens if we go through all this forgiveness and we wake up and <coughs> go back to heaven and we go, oops, <laughs> what if we fall from grace again? I say, no, it's impossible, the Holy Spirit is like your insurance policy. Uh, you can't. <laughs> It's like this, this voice that's a reminder that you can never separate from God. You couldn't even do it the first time, uh, much less the second time. It's, it's reminding you that you were just, it just was a bad dream or a mistake to even think that you could even separate at all. So this whole world is kind of like fantasy, imagination, um, it's make-believe, like fairy tales, and uh, 
people say, well, if that's the case, why, why do anything? I say, yeah, precisely. Uh, that's a good question. What, what would be the motive? What is the motive for doing anything? You would have to do it out of joy or inspiration uh, for it to be meaningful. And what I discovered in my life was that was, I was doing most everything in my life based on fear of consequences. If I don't work, if I don't exercise, if I don't eat right, if I don't do this and this and this and this for my girlfriend, she's going to leave me. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> you, get, you get boxed in real quick into a role and, and to try to be a good, when we're children, be a good little boy, be a good little girl, behave yourself. Okay, behave myself, behave myself. But mm, what about this feeling? Forget about that, behave yourself. As if you can just act good while you've got all this emotional turmoil going on. And now Jesus is saying, don't worry about the behavior so much. What you do comes from what you think. <coughs> you need to work with your thoughts and your beliefs because your behavior flows automatically from them. So the whole course is really aimed not at giving us a ten more commandments, you know, like the Mel Brooks uh, film Blazing Saddles, where God gives 20 commandments to Moses, and Moses has got the two tablets, and then he's carrying the two tablets, and everything. And then he, <coughs> he cracks, <laughs> right before he's ready to deliver the 20 commandments, he drops <laughs> 10 of God's <laughs> commandments, and they crack, and you can't even read them anymore. And he goes, I gave you these 20, 10! <laughs> then he, it's like a Woody Allen kind of, you know, they all were together, those comedians, Mel Brooks, Woody Allen, Carl Reiner, you know, a group of them, and they had a lot of funny stuff, but kind of poking fun at it, <laughs> blowing it with God. So, uh, would, um, would our creations be the fan club that's waiting for us to hear us start singing in gratitude, so that they, they can, they're vibrating, I'm vibrating, so I'm, they're more, I'm more aware of that, that yeah. whole consciousness. That whole consciousness. Right now. Yeah, yeah right now. Like, they're, they're singing in joy because of who they are. Christ is singing in joy because of Christ, and God is in joy. So they're all in that happy song of just eternal gratitude. Mm. No time, no beginning, no end, no bodies, no perception, just pure light and pure spirit. And they're waiting for you, meaning uh, they're waiting for you to remember who you are, so then you'll know who they are. And, and they want you to know who they are because it's, recognition. It's, it's a recognition of such wonderment and joy. But, but the thing that makes them difficult, I mean, I get that question a lot about the creations, because, because there's nothing in this world that could help you relate to them. Uh, you couldn't say it's like, it's like when I went to saw that waterfall, Iguazu Falls. No, that's not, <coughs> it's not like that. It's like the first kiss I had. No, it's not like that. <laughs> it's like uh, when I had a child and I looked into their eyes. No. <laughs> It's like there's nothing of this world, the most intense feeling of joy and happiness in this world, wouldn't even come close to this state of eternity, because it's all involved time and perceptions. But the Course is all about approaching that state through forgiveness, like this is the realm of consciousness, and consciousness can be trained. You've heard people for years, even back in the 60s, say, come on man, expand your consciousness, you know, be a little more open-minded. Yeah, consciousness can be expanded, can be trained, only to reach a state of, of, of the happy dream or of forgiveness that Jesus talks about, which is still one step before. It's like God will take the final step, and that final step isn't at the end, it's more at the, it's prior to to this whole loop of time. And when you finally have reverse amnesia and you forget this world, then, yeah. then you remember <coughs> the, the steps creation. Already taken. Yeah, the steps already taken. You're just remembering what is. That's all it's about.
She's I using the Am final 30 minutes to go out and film oh, the landscape on our walk. Okay. All right. It's easier. Just get so yeah, we've got plenty on the yeah. inside. We need some of this beautiful okay, I'll be right back. landscape. Yeah. Sarah, did anybody see Sarah? So just get some salt. Sarah went up to get um, camera. Uh, something. Camera. Hey, Jenny. <laughs> camera. Um, this was in Belgium, and they brought this uh, psychotherapist brought one of her uh, patients to meet me and to do a one-on-one -on -one with me. And she said afterwards, she said, well, "I've heard all this stuff about this course in miracles, but it sounded really hard and difficult. But listening to you, it sounds more fun. I think I'm going to go and <laughs> get it." <laughs> so, she was going, remember her? She yeah, ended up oh yeah. talking to you after that. Yeah. So. But it's sometimes best if you get it, you're just, a, you catch it just at the right time, and you catch it before you even read the book, you got the paragraph. Yeah. Uh, the secret of the secret. You go for the, the core. She told me not three months ago to save me some reading. <laughs> Now this is what you came to Ireland for, have a look at these rocks. Oh yes. And Who knows the history of the rocks here? I know burned. Thousands of years, hundreds and thousands yeah. of years old. I think so. Yeah, but just um, it's karst, which is limestone. And when the rain falls on it, it creates fissures because it eats it away. It's quite soft in places and they go really, really deep. And then there's all these huge under rock cave systems that run the whole length. And then there's turlocks which come up, which are lakes that just when the water table rises, they can suddenly appear out of nowhere. Oh. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so the, because it's such an unusual landscape, um, there's flora and fauna that you can't find anywhere else in the world here. Um, especially, um, you know, flowers and things down in the little crevices mm. that um, yeah. have ideal conditions that apparently aren't ideal anywhere else. So. Mm. Yeah. And a turlock mm. is, is an underground river that, mm. that uh, uh, an irrigate or yes, underground river systems has come up with high, high water tables, yeah. Otherwise the land is dry through the summer and then the winter it's a lake. Mm. Uh, where's Malak Moor from here, Tom? I think Malak Moor is, is uh, well, Malak is up near um, St. Clair, it's up near um, Spanish Point Way. Oh, is that far? Mm -hmm. But it's similar rocks. Yeah, yeah. And it's in the form of, um, like, not quite a pyramid structure, but a mound structure that tears the whole way up and um, got spiritual significance as well as everything else. And the government yeah. wanted to build a uh, uh, an interpreter center on it. Hmm? Give it back. Give it back. <laughs> <laughs> You're attached to it, are you? Yeah, attached to it. Did you write uh, the four things on your I did. I inside? Still there. Yeah, yeah. For practicing with Hewlands. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 We'll all yeah. be heading off from then anyway. Oh, perfect. Yeah.
<laughs> Is that Galway up there, Tom? It's Galway, yeah. yeah. That's a bad now. They got away. See, and all these now we have disciplines. There's, they're designed to help fill out the wonder questions. But then, no one's saying, well, where did this whole, all this wondering and wandering in time and space, where did all this begin? And you know, that's where you start to trace it back and say, well, I don't know, but I want peace, and I want this. Whatever I've done, I want it to be undone, so I can just rest. I don't want this constant chatter. Of pondering, wondering, just wandering through. Lost in Space was an old television show <laughs> that I used to watch Muppets, growing up. The pigs, the lost in yeah. Space. <laughs> yeah. Lost in Space. There was an original show of, it was a science fiction show, but <coughs> it was a robot. Danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger. You know, it was always, the robot was warning of danger, but they were, this, the Robinson family was lost in space. and. You could say that everyone who comes to this planet is lost in space. And the ones that have houses think they're, they have homes, and then they, they point to the ones on the street and say that those are the homeless. <laughs> but, but again, everyone's homeless. Or you think that there are the schizophrenics that are locked up in the, uh, in the mental institution, but sch schizophrenia is split. And everyone who comes to this planet has a split mind. That's the definition of coming. You don't come unless your mind is split between love and fear. And so, that's why it's so confusing. That's why it's, it's sometimes it's such a difficult road, in a very intense journey, is because underneath the occurrences and events of the world, there's this, there's a split mind, and it's like, just like in this world, you can't mix oil and water. You can put oil mm -hmm. in a blender, and water in a blender, and you can blend it as fast as you want, and for as long as you want, and it will still, it will still separate. And it's kind of like love and fear. You can try and try and try to blend them together in your mind, which is what this whole human experiment is about, to try to blend love and fear and see if we can get a, a synthetic mix, you know, fub instead of love. <laughs> fub. <laughs> I fub you. I love you. <laughs> That's more accurate, actually, yeah. when you fall in love in this world, right? I love you. <laughs> What's that? Uh, well, I fear you and I love you, but I'm not sure. I'm not, but I'm addicted. Out of my mind. I love you. Yeah. And you, okay, I'm picking you to be my partner, but just remember there's, there's about three billion other potential choices. <laughs> and if you don't live up to my standards and expectations, there's a lot of fish in the sea. I'll just pick somebody else. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. I've never received unconditional love my whole life. My parents didn't give it to me. My boyfriends, girlfriends, sisters, parents. But you, oh special one, you now have the opportunity to provide me with unconditional love. And there's no pressure. <laughs> Even though others have failed before you. All yes. others have failed. I've been punished. <laughs> On this planet, okay. we, I was just dividing the six billion <laughs> by two for the sexes. So I was saying three billion, but I guess you have to. Do. I only need one. <laughs> <laughs> just one will do. And we're all scared of death, and yet it's the most joyous experience. Everybody doesn't want to even talk about it. Mm. It's like we don't want to talk about God. Mm. Yeah, and I also say you can't you can't just die to get back to heaven. It's more it's, it's resurrecting your mind. It's, that's why the inner journey is so important. And it seems like of the six billion, there's just a small fraction that seem to be at this point really sincerely or consciously aware that there's like a spiritual evolution going on. Others kind of just have, are following religious beliefs that were kind of handed down, you know. I know that, you know, for myself, with my biological family, you know, my sister seemed to just follow in my parents' footsteps. She goes to the same church, she's part of the same political party, you know, it's, this, it's really very typical of this world when people grow up in a community or a country where they, they're 
they seem to be born and raised and then they seem to grow old and die right there. You know, people make jokes, as even in Cincinnati where I live, they make jokes about a few neighborhoods that are very kind of traditional where people never leave <laughs> the neighborhood their whole life. <laughs> They're born in the west end of this this particular neighborhood and they they, they stay there their whole lives and they, they die <laughs> in that end and they never really you know, explore or question that there's anything more. But I think that's what brings the group of us together is there's something inside that's going, you know, there's something more and I know it and I, I maybe don't know exactly how to access it completely but I know that it's there and I feel like I'm being drawn towards it. And that we save time by coming together like this because we learn from each other's experiences and we are inspired by each other's experiences to, to not give up hope, you know, on the, on the journey, which can sometimes seem pretty long, like a, a very, like the Beatles said, a long and winding road. <laughs> sometimes it can seem that way. <laughs>